Hi, I'm Barbara Hammer. I'm a filmmaker and I'm here at the Bear Lenali with my new piece. It's a short film about living with cancer and enjoying life. And it's called Evidentiary Bodies. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah Congdon and I'm here with Barbara Hammer talking to her about her experimental film, Evidentiary Bodies. Hi Barbara, thank you for Hi. talking to us today. Thank you Hannah, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Um, so first of all I wanted to ask you about your relationship with the Teddy Award. So you've won the Teddy Award for three of your films over the last few years. Um, so that was um, My Dare and Sink, Generations and A Horse Is Not A Metaphor. Um, what does the Teddy Award mean to you and for queer cinema generally? The Teddy Award is very spectacular. Everybody knows what it is. And the exciting thing about it for me is that this year I get to see them presented. So all the other years when I won them, I was not here. Oh, really? <laughs> and somebody else had to go uh, get it for me, you know, like a friend um, who was in the audience, another filmmaker. Yeah. So I've never, except for back in 93 when Nan Golden won, I had made Nitrate Kisses. Mm. And I was thinking, maybe I'm in competition. But she received it. Then it was very small. Mm. We didn't meet at the airport. I don't know where we meet now, but I've seen pictures and it's like a huge hall filled yeah. with people and there's a big dance party afterwards. And But back then it was more like a cafe. Yeah. Smoky and I mean at that time people smoked in the room and there were two levels to it and we had tables with drinks and um, there weren't that many people there, you know, a couple, maybe a couple hundred maybe a hundred. It mm. was small. And the Teddy Award, as we know it, with the bear, hadn't been made yet. I don't know what the award was. I didn't get it. So I don't know what it was. Maybe it was um, a piece of paper or, yeah. you know, a scroll or something. Um, but I'm very honored that three of my short films have received it over the years. It was quite a surprise mm. to me. And I'm very happy. And when Gina Carducci, who is now Joey Carducci, and I won for generations, we made sure that we had two teddies because Joey wanted one. Yeah. And then I wanted one. So we actually paid for a second <laughs> teddy award. Deserved it. <laughs> yeah. And that worked out. Yeah. And so what's it been like to see it develop over the years? It must be quite surreal. Having well, you know, I just hear about it, so I haven't seen it. Yeah. But it looks like a major blast in a party. And last time I was here was 2015 without a film in the festival, but I was here. And people would talk about it as the event to go to. Mm. Now, I don't know if it's still that way or not. We hope so. <laughs> having just arrived, you know, I yeah. don't know. Oh, it would be lovely to actually have you there on the night. Yeah, <laughs> Finally. I'm so excited. Finally, <laughs> I made it, you know. <laughs> Last time they called me, I was in Spain because I'd gone to see um, the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Mm. And there was no way I could get back in time. Yeah. You know, they called to say, you've won the Teddy. Can you come back? Oh, I want to. But it was really <laughs> hard to get here. I, I'll never do it within the time span I had. Yeah. So it'll be really great just to experience the teddies. 
mm. this time around. And so you're here this year with uh, evidentiary bodies, um, which you've explained was um, initially part of a kind of installation project. So can you mm -hmm. contextualise the film a little bit and, and mm -hmm. how you presented it in the first place as part of that exhibition? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm living with cancer and I have been for 12 years. So there's been a lot of ups and downs with the different kinds of treatment that I receive. And the year that I shot evidentiary bodies or had my assistant shoot me, um, was a very difficult year. So the chemo that I was taking was very hard on my body. And if you look, you even see blood in my nostrils sometimes. And I mean, I wasn't really like checking in the mirror to see what I looked like before we shot. But I would have these ideas. I would have creative ideas no matter how sick I was. Mm. And so I would employ her, ask her to come in like one day out of a month, maybe, maybe every two weeks. And we'd do my idea. Mm. Most of them had to do with projecting on my body paint or scans of my body that had already been taken. Like I have the scene where the CAT scan is projected on my head. So when you're going through medical treatments, they're taking a lot of images of you, but you don't get to own them back yeah. unless you do something like this with them. Yeah. And in a way, it's having control of my destiny to make art out of um, medical diagnoses and um, examples of um, dire conditions, mm. but to take those and turn them into what I hope is beautiful and poignant. Yeah. And I know you've got the diagram um, of your exhibition space. Would yes. it be possible to just explain that a little bit um, yeah. and show us a little bit of the um, right. space itself? <laughs> Before there was a film, there was a performance. And that was in October 2016. So it wasn't last year. It's a year before that. And we worked on this performance. I wanted people to experience what it was like to go into a hospital. So walking into the gallery, microscope gallery in New York we used, you walk through a screen of hanging x-rays. On the screen of x-rays, several of them, five of them, are projected CAT scans of a torso of the body. Then before you come into the room actually, you're given little booties to wear. All my assistants, like there's six or seven, are wearing lab coats and I'm in a white bodysuit. And you come in and one of the, actually my partner, my spouse of 29 years in July. Very impressive. <laughs> Lori Burke um, was projecting text on the wall in a corner so that it, it was difficult to read, but you could read it. And it's about how cancer is not war. There's no war on cancer. How we are misusing terms to talk about illness. Mm. We talk about it as if it were a battle. Yeah. You know, somebody dies, they say, oh, you know, she was so brave. You're not brave. You're living with cancer. You do what you need to do. You're not fighting a war. We should keep those words for the war zones that we are actually in, like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. And, you know, there's many, plenty of wars to choose from. Mm. Um, so that was going on and then I did a series of activities having to do with breathing and the lungs along the wall were photographs of x-rays of the chest that had been hand painted and printed there were balloons weather balloons 12 foot hanging from the ceiling Scott was playing the cello in the corner um, I would move from one activity to another. Finally, at the end, there's a rotary projector table that I had built. The Tate, actually, in London built it for me, but it copied one that I had from the 70s. And I used to, well, and I still do, I do a performance where I show film all around the room. It's called Available Space. Mm -hmm. Trying to get film off the screen and using the architecture we don't have to always think about film as being a rectangle. 
mm. the way the camera is made. It could have been made as a circle or a triangle or a parallelogram or something different, or and there so could be many shapes. The architecture of the space kind of reforms the images. Exactly. Okay. So um, I had this rotary projector table for the first time I stood on it myself. And Flory turned me, and I have a handheld projector that I projected the image of me walking through 16 millimeter hand painted film. It's four mm -hmm. minutes long. And I sort of dance like you see in the film. And it goes all the way around the room, and that's the culmination. But then it was kind of a heavy ending. So I found this dance party film of she and I dancing with women's music from the 70s, yeah. like Chris Williamson, Margie Adams. And so we're dancing and we're signing. She used to work with deafness, so she does American Sign Language. So she's signing the words of the song and I'm kind of imitating. So that brought kind of a joyousness back yeah. before the performance was over, but some people cried, they told me. Only 70 people saw that piece. So after that, I needed to make a film so yeah. that more people could see at least the imagery if not the performance. Did you only do that performance once then? Yes. Right, okay. And something um, in, it sort of relates to what you were just saying about the dancing and the movement. Um, within the film, when it has your body kind of moving along the reel of film, um, it feels almost like it's trying to escape both these kind of fixed scanned images and the, almost the reel of the film itself. And I know in, um, it wasn't, it's not a metaphor, you talked about freedom being movement and a huge part of that film was the ability to move beyond your body almost. Um, how much did that idea of movement and freedom play into um, evidentiary bodies as well? A lot, because I feel like my life has been in film. In a way I feel trapped by film. That's why you have, always I want you to know, this is the sprocket holes at the top and the bottom, these are the frame lines. Because I've dedicated my life to making films. I could have been horseback riding or climbing more mountains. Yeah. You know, I'm doing all the things that I love to do. So that was very important to me that I keep the metaphor or the imagery of film mm. trapping the body because the body doesn't escape. It actually blends when I lie down in the film and disappear into one of the acid drops, that's hydrochloric acid I've thrown on the film. Okay. Then, you know, the film, the quietness, the audio fades away, that's the end. Yeah. So in a way, it's a life lived in film. Yeah, and we all make our choices, yeah. and that was the choice that I made, and it's made me very happy, but, you know, there are a lot of things I didn't do, as we all make choices. And so is there almost a, is, is there a happiness to be kind of trapped within those pockets of those, that film reel, or is there an anxiety in that as well? Is there an anxiety, did you say? Yeah. Um, I think it's up to the viewer to bring to a metaphoric film, a symbolic film, a film of gesture and poetry, whatever reading you want to bring to it. Mm. That's why there's an openness to the form. Yeah. It's not fixed. It's multiple screens. It's made to be shown as three screens in installation. It's not made to be shown like we're seeing it here at the Berlinale. That's what I was going to ask <clears throat> us about the, the why, why that trilogy, why the, those three images? Well, because I want it, I want you to be surrounded. Mm -hmm. So I have um, a diagram where you walk through the, the x-rays. So again, I've recreated my transmission screens of x-rays. You walk through them into the space where the projection is as large as the wall. And you have one image here and then the other two here. Small bench here that you sit on. And the piece goes for nine minutes when you exit 
either it loops, if you exit, it, it stops until somebody else walks in. So it's made for an installation, mm -hmm. but it's shown this way because I only finished it late December and it was like, what do I do now? I finished this <laughs> three channel work yeah. and I'm not known for making a lot of installations. So I made some, how do I get it out? Where should I? So I just thought I better send it to Stephanie and let her see what I'm doing. And you know, they really kind of had to juggle, I think, to find a way to show it. Mm. And they couldn't, I think the academy was fixed. It already had its program. Um, I don't really know the details, but they couldn't show it as a three channel work. Mm. So I thought better to show it than not at all. Yeah. So that was the decision I made. And those scanned images, can you tell me um, a, how you actually made them? You were talking about hand painting and, and superimposing different images. Um, and also what those scanned images mean to you. What does it mean to see your body in a scanned form? How does that make you feel? Are you talking about which scanned image? Um, so within the film, you know, when we have the shots of the head and we sort of start to see what's on the inside of the head, it's like an x-ray vision almost. And mm -hmm. I think there's a few of the lungs as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's meaning those. Mm -hmm. Well, the CAT scans are made by the hospital. Mm -hmm and they take slices so that they can look very closely for any kinds of tumors or disturbances. And as they're beautiful, especially the torso, the ones I found of the torso, they are mine. Mm. There were all these different colors. And one of them said UCLA, and the others had other kinds of numbers or names. So I never figured out. And when I've talked to people there, they don't, at the hospital, they don't seem to know. Why did I get all these different renditions of the same CAT scan? But I think it's for other hospitals who might have different system. Anyway, I'm going off the deep end here into very small details. <laughs> but to be able to get the scans of your own body and reuse them, again, is taking power back from the institution that seems to be controlling you yeah. and using it yourself, showing the world in a way we don't get to really look at those. And most people don't look at their scans. If they do, they don't take them home and study them. Yeah. And to me, to project the CAT scan back on my head, that was the way we started the whole film. Yeah. Because I just had the image that we should project it from above and it should be directly on my head. And um, in the performance, we start by shaving my head and then projecting. Okay. Um, it's reclaiming, it's re-owning something that looks like the experts own. Mm. And with those scans, um, so a lot of the film, it, we shift from uh, sort of opaque images of the body, so like external images of the body, mm -hmm. uh, and then we go to these sort of x-ray visions and they're superimposed on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And so much of your work has been about making the invisible visible. I thought that was a really interesting parallel mm -hmm. um, that you sort of created there. You know, I was, you know, through this, like all my work about, like, you know, a horse is not a metaphor about living with cancer and aging, it comes from didactics. If I'm going to show youthful 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds cavorting in nature, making love, why aren't I sticking with the body all the way through? Mm. So why keep this held back, the body and illness? That's part of our experience as well. Mm. So that's and probably invisible. So that was another reason why I wanted to make that invisibility visible. Yeah. So even w the invisibility within the body. Within the, the body. Actually rendering visible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you talked a lot about the capacity for the film to uh, evoke empathy. Um, and mm -hmm. film generally to evoke empathy, and specifically mm -hmm. experimental film, mm -hmm. and so how that creates the textures of, of feeling, perhaps more so than other um, forms of film. Mm -hmm. How exactly do you feel you're evoking empathy with this film? I see empathy as a way for us to come together from our diverse landscapes mm. and pol political, 
ways of thinking that if we can feel for each other a concern, if we learn how to listen and go into the other's almost psyche when we listen, then we have a chance to bring forth the honesty of ourselves and share that. And two people doing that together, how could there not be empathy? Mm. And looking at little children, studies that have been done, you know, two-year-olds, oh, I've got a boo-boo. Can I kiss it? Somebody will say, oh, here, have my candy. You know, we want to take care of each other from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And then it gets disappeared as we move into social structures of striving and competition. And we see the other as a, in terms of adversity, rather than commonality. So I was hoping, and I was calling the film Empathy for a while, I was hoping that seeing the body still dancing, still moving, still finding the pleasure in creativity, mm. um, but suffering would bring forth an empathy in the audience. And even if it's just held in that theater for the nine minutes of the film, that's enough for a beginning. And Scott Johnson is going to be playing live um, at a number of your screenings at the Berlinale. Mm -hmm. And the music is a very big part, I think, of the feeling that we that evolves throughout um, the nine minutes of the film. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the musical decisions behind the film? Well, Scott and I met in an airport in uh, Stockholm. We were both on our way to Oslo. And we became friends, and we hung out that weekend. I didn't know him. He was um, an architect. When we got back to New York, I found he lived pretty close to me, and he played the cello. And I was working on this film, and I didn't have any idea for... I was working on the performance. And I said, do you want to jam? I'm not a musician, but he would come over. And we had another friend who we were working with, too, and she would make contact mics, and we'd put them on our cheek and make sounds, and I was recording everything. We would put it on his cello. We would find different ways of experiencing this instrument. And so through these sessions, he got very excited because his creative gene got turned on too. And we decided to use his playing then in the film. And one of the things that we do in the performance is we take these IV poles that you have dripping into you with saline or chemo. And on one, we mount my little camera, which shows me going over and over and over again down the hallway of the hospital, getting more drips. And the other one, he has his cello on. And so we walk around the room, like Mutt and Jeff, two characters following each other with the projection and the cello being played. Yeah. So it's all done in the spirit of experimentation. And he's very talented and he was able to, well, somebody, he made a script, a score of the film, uh, especially the last, this is the last four minutes of the film when I'm disappeared into mm. the 16 millimeter um, film itself. And I had these on the wall, 11 by 14. There were about eight of them. Yeah. And somebody who was over um, saw this, and she said, I know somebody who would publish this. Would you like a little chat book? And we thought, oh, that sounds nice. Mm. So these got published by Impatient Press. And um, we also included the diagram for the performance yeah. um, that Scott drew at the end. Um, so now there's talk about doing the entire film with the whole nine minute and with the new score. It's just going on and on. It's like cycling back to each other. We also went to a David Lawrence Goldman's place and he has a um, sound studio and we did a lot of creative recording there like breathing. <laughs> 
They would do things like that. Yeah. And then he'd take that sound and he would like mix it into a strange other, like an application that had a lot of filters to it. And then I would go home with all this music, you know, on a thumb drive. Yeah. And then I was able to compose the score for the film. Amazing. So the, the, actually the body and the sounds of the body are very much interwoven with that soundtrack. Yeah. Yep. And then when that was finished, Scott said, I want to add again. So he started playing live to the film. So now the question is, do we make, make a new soundtrack from what he's playing live and remix the sound? Yeah. I and think also, we just keep it as, you know, a, an event. Mm. And you're superimposing so much with the actual film, but then you're also superimposing layers of the different music as well. So it's yeah. getting a huge amount of depth on both the visual. You can do a lot in nine minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like if you separate it all out, you know, it would probably be at least a 30 minute film mm. if you took all the layering. Mm. And with the images of, of your body on the film, it kind of helped noticing that that's very much, given how much your work is focused on archiving and remembrance and recognition and documentation, that sort of, it is a physical documentation of your body as well. Mm -hmm. How much um, was archiving kind of on your mind when you were making this film? Mm -hmm. Archiving's been on my mind a lot, but not in terms of making this film. Um, this film is more lived experience in the present. So mm -hmm. it's always very present when we were filming. Um, an archive lives in a box. Yeah. You know, it's stuffy, it's done, it's past. This is done in the now. Um, so I see them as two separate processes. Okay. I didn't pull out footage from five years ago, three years ago. It was all contemporary. Mm. And with, the, um, with films like Optic Nerve, you looked at how film itself, and particularly 16mm film, can um, disintegrate, can decay. And in this film, you kind of dissolve into the film reel, and you were saying how you put the hydrochloric... The body dissolves, the yeah. body decays. Mm -hmm. um, and you were saying how you put hydrochloric acid on, on the actual film. How much is this an exploration, again, of the um, maybe legacy of film itself, of your work, of keep, or maintaining the image of your work? Maybe. Well, I think there's a lot of queer space and abstraction. Mm. And throwing the hydrochloric acid on the 16 millimeter film is a way of making that space. Mm. It dissolves what's already been there and yet makes a new brilliant color, um, something we haven't seen before. So you can think of that as a possibility for queer expression. Yeah. And I don't think we've talked about that enough and how limiting it is to use mm, representation of the body as the delimiting form of what queerness is. Yeah. So if we do something abstract, we scan the x-rays and they get more and more hard to read because of all the colors on them, mm. then we abstract and we allow space for the viewer to enter and, I don't know, have their own uh, agency, their own sense of who they are. Yeah. So that was another and always has been part of my work to give the viewer strength and um, authority not to tell a story that I decide the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, and I think through abstraction and through working with the materiality of film and the digital possibilities um, that we have with filters and the editing system and color changes and multiple viewings and, you know, it's just a big toy box. Yeah. Um, but we can really uh, engage the viewer so that they feel their own creativity.
mm. and their own ability to expand um, in thinking. Why did she do? I like your questions are a very good example <laughs> of what what I was trying to do. Yeah, success. I've been, <laughs> I've been successful like with you. <laughs> Um, so many of your previous works have also seen you in dialogue with um, other female, and particularly queer female um, artists. So, for example, um, Maya Darren Sink, and you also um, documented Elizabeth Bishop's work. Um, and I wondered, are you in dialogue with any particular um, female or queer artists in this film at all? Hmm. I guess aspects of myself. Yeah, well, that was actually what I was, th <laughs> what I was thinking. Really? Yeah. Oh, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who dances with a nude, old, cancer-ridden body but your other joyful self, you know? Um, yeah, it's all about pleasure, pleasure within pain, mm. and overcoming pain with pleasure. Um yeah, I think the dialogue is with myself and with the people who I worked with, like the seven assistants and my spouse um, during the performance, or with Scott and my camera person, Angel. Um, um, all queer to the bone, <laughs> but not everybody is queer that I work with. Uh, some are cisgendered, um, and um, but they have a talent and a skill that I need and want to incorporate in the work. Mm. And a number of our um, filmmakers actually this year who we've interviewed, so um, from mm -hmm. Teddy Award, have actually referenced you and said that they're influenced by your work. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to then be taken into other people's um, kind of work and dialogue and, and for that to continue into later generations. It is amazing what has happened to me this year in particular. Um, and it's been growing. You know, when I began, when I was like, I don't know, was I was married to a man. I was 28 years old. I was identifying myself as an artist. I was making work, not for a gallery, not for the Berlinale, just for myself. Mm. That continued for a long time. And then to see that a lot of the work, especially the 70s work and, and other essay films that came later in the 90s, mean a lot to another generation or several generations by now. It was surprising. And, you know, in a way, why would I be surprised? I made so much work. I, maybe because it was never intentional, although I love being a mentor. And I love influencing, especially not in copying, but in giving energy back and believing in the creative spirit of each person. Mm -hmm. I love doing that. Um, but this year I had a retrospective showing my artwork as well as my films. And I had a, a photography show in New York and I had screenings all over the city in many venues for four or five months. So every two weeks I was going somewhere in Manhattan or Queens and showing my work. And it was fatiguing and thrilling. And, you know, I finally have my moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really glad I'm alive to experience it because so many people aren't. Mm. and they're recognized after their death. But it's really all a surprise in a lot of ways, and that's good. Mm. It's not something expected. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been really, really lovely. And yeah, it's so nice to actually have <laughs> you be able to come to the Teddy Award. Um, um, so I know, isn't that great? <laughs> and thank you for doing all the research that you put in for the interview. I'm very um, taken by it. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. okay.